Good morning, everyone from Luxor. During my travels throughout Egypt, it was his image that caught my attention the most. Ubiquitous, gigantic images of Ramesses the Great, always presented with a calm, gentle smile, adorn numbers of great temples. Let's explore his mortuary temple, where his cult was to flourish for more than a million years. The Ramesseum Let's go! Construction works began at the beginning of Ramesses' reign, so around 1278 BCE, and were completed three years later. The decorations, however, were not finished for 16 more years, hence it's officially acknowledged that the temple was built for over 20 years. In front of the monumental pylon, initially 70 meters wide and 22 meters high, flanked by gardens, was a key connected to a canal. The pylon is decorated with military scenes, war campaigns from the 5th and the 8th Regnary, among them the famous Battle of Kadesh, which I described in my previous episode from Abu Simbel, you can find the link below. Or at least I presented a course of events from Ramasi's point of view, according to which, in solitude, with the support of a moon alone, he defeated thousands of enemies on his own. However, my attention was drawn to the description of Ramasi's relationship with the enemy immediately after the battle, presented much in Ramasi's style. Listen up! Then the wretched vanquished prince of Hatti sent a letter. The land of Egypt and the land of Hatti, they are thine, thy servants, and they are beneath thy feet, for Re, thy august father, has given them to thee. Do not act mightily against us, for behold, thy prowess is great and thy strength is burdensome on the land of Hatti. Is thy slaughtering of thy servants good? For thy face is savage among them, and thou hast no pity. Behold, thou maddest yesterday thy slaughter of hundreds of thousands, and today thou art coming again, thou will leave us no heirs. Do not make thy answer harsh, O mighty king, for peace is more satisfactory than combat. Give us wrath. And what was Ramesses' response? Stay with me to find that out! Though nothing in front of the pylon survived, and today, if approaching the temple from its original entrance, one can easily get lost among vast tomato and sugarcane fields, you can presume that some kind of an outstanding passage, perhaps with rows of colossal statues or columns, must have led to this imposing entrance. We have a rare opportunity to admire the view from the top of the pylon. During Ramasi's lifetime, the temple was known as the mansion of million of years of the powerful one of Math. The justice of Ra is powerful, chosen of Ra, united with Thebes in the domain of Amun. Oh, centuries later, the monument was called Memnonium, or Tomb of Ozymandias, to finally become the Ramassium, name created by Champollion in the beginning of the 19th century. By the way, Champollion considered Ramassium 
the most splendid monument in Thebes. The first courtyard, about 53 by 43 meters, is in a terrible state of preservation, but this is the spot where one of the most outstanding sculptures once stood. I'm speaking about a red granite colossus, one of the highest in Egypt, measuring around 20 meters in height and weighing roughly 1,000 tons, depicting obviously Ramesses seated on the throne. It was transported from Aswan. 270 kilometers. Though today only the pedestal and part of its torso remains, it was the largest ancient quarried and moved statue in the world. Diodorus Siculus, who visited Egypt between 60 to 57 BCE, said about the statue, quote, And it is not merely for its size that this work merits approbation, but it is also marvelous by reason of its artistic quality and excellent because of the nature of the stone, since in a block of so great a size there is not a single crack or blemish to be seen. Moreover, Diodorus claims that this imposing monolith bore an inscription. King of kings am I, Ozymandias. If anyone would know how great I am and where I lie, let him surpass one of my works. Quite impressive, isn't it? The cartouches carved on the arms of the statues are characteristic of the Ramesid period. Why was it so? Perhaps because Ramesses very often reused the statues of his predecessors and signed them with his name. It's my third visit in Ramasium. I would say that this place is underrated, but it's very good for me, because, just listen, silence. The second courtyard, measuring 54 by 43 meters, originally featured 16 columns, eight on the western and eight on the eastern side. In contrast to the first courtyard, there isn't one, but three ramps leading to the next part of the temple. The middle entrance was flanked by two granite statues, but the one on the right is missing the entire body, whereas from the left one only the lower part remains. Although the body of the northern statue is lost and gone, the upper part of the southern one was shipped away by Belzoni and today is known as the Younger Memnon, needless to say on a display in the British Museum. The temple was erected on the site of an older shrine, built by Seti I. The entire sanctuary is positioned on the east-west axis and is facing the Temple of Luxor, located on the opposite side of the Nile. Even though the reliefs from the Battle of Kadesh cover the walls of Ramesses' temples, and indeed it was the largest chariot confrontation ever fought, it was the aftermath of the battle that has become the most important signing of the first peace treaty in history.
It was ratified in 1258 BCE by Ramesses II and successor of Muvatali II, Hattusili III. Its part reads as follows. Ramesses, the great king, the king of the country of Egypt, shall never attack the country of Hatti to take possession of a part of this country, and Hattusili, the great king, the king of the country of Hatti, shall never attack the country of Egypt to take possession of a part of this country. The treaty was written in Akkadian. This language of Assyrians and Babylonians was a language of diplomacy at that time. One copy of the treaty, in hieroglyphics, was inscribed on a stele in the temple of Karnak. A second copy on a clay tablet was discovered in Turkey in 1906. The significance of this peace treaty is reflected in the fact that a replica of the tablet is on display at the United Nations headquarters in New York. Another military scene. Hittite warriors are presented with partially shaved heads and in a disorganized formation to underline their different origins, as foreigners were presented as perceived, chaotic in nature, and therefore enemies of Maat, but servants of Isfad, chaos. Hence, the fight with them was religiously justified. Though the outcome of the Battle of Kadesh was inconclusive and eventually ended with a peace treaty, it didn't stop Ramesses to create an atmosphere of success and get all the glory possible. Let's hear what Ramesses' army supposedly said after the battle. Hail thou goodly warrior, making firm the heart, thou hast rescued thy infantry and thy chariotry, thou art the son of a moon, the efficient one, for thou hast destroyed the land of Hati by thy powerful arm. Thou art the goodly warrior, without thy like, a king fighting for his army on the day of combat. Thou art great of courage, foremost in the fray, for thou hast taken no wreck of all lands together. Thou art rich of victory in the presence of thy army, and against the entire world. It is not said as a boast protector of Egypt and binder of foreign lands, for thou hast broken the back of Hatti forever. Nevertheless, these two nations would continue a mutually beneficial relationship until the fall of the Hittite Empire, circa 1200 BCE. If you'd like to know more about Hittites, i link below my episode about Hattusa from my last visit in Turkey. Enjoy! The hypostyle hole leads to two smaller holes, each displays eight columns. The first one, about 10 by 16.5 meters, bears two names. The boat's room, as it displays divine barks of gods like Khonsu or Mut, and boats of the pharaoh and royal family. Its second name is the astronomy room, because of its roof with celestial bodies and lunar calendar. The hypostyle hall measures approximately 40 by 30 meters and included 48 papyrus columns, arranged into six rows. This stone forest featured 12 central columns, 10 meters high, with open papyrus capitals. Along 
with the closed bed capitals of the smaller side columns. They symbolize the primeval marshes, shelter of Isis from Seth after the murder of her husband Osiris, and where she gave birth to Horus, who represents the king. Moreover, the columns in the central row illustrated 12 months, while the remaining 36 pillars represented decans, the subdivisions of the zodiac signs, lasting approximately 10 days each. What's interesting is that almost all the high officials in the days of Ramesses overseeing his mortuary temple were buried not in Thebes but in Saqqara, like for example Tia, Ramesses' brother-in-law, who served here as a superintendent of the treasure and livestock. Memphis, with its necropolis, was restored to its former glory during the reign of Ramesses the Great, who, like his father, financed the priests of Ptah and expanded the necropolis in Saqqara. He built the Serapium where his son, Hemwa said, who held the most prestigious office of the high priest of Ptah, was responsible for the sacred tombs of Apis bulls. All this to legitimize the power of the young 19th dynasty. It was near Memphis in the eastern part of the Nile Delta that Ramesses established his capital, Pyramesis. The entire sanctuary was built mainly of sandstone. It measures about 280 by 220 meters and includes two stone temples in its center, surrounded by mud brick buildings. Thanks to the royal scribe Paneshi, head of the treasury, we can try to grasp the sheer size of this enormous undertaking. According to him, in the 24th regnal year, more than 48,000 people were working in the agricultural sector only. And apart from vast farmlands, they were responsible for more than 7 million fowl and 11 million donkeys. During the festivals, which lasted even for 20 days, on the menu were several thousand bread loaves and cakes and almost 400 measures of beer. Although these numbers don't add up and are for sure exaggerated, we have to bear in mind that mortuary temples were apples of Pharaoh's eyes, and they didn't skimp on them. For example, Ramesses III, whose mortuary temple in Medinat Habu I showed you a few months ago, link below in the description, was spending about 20% of Karnak's revenue on his mortuary monument and his maintenance. These mud brick structures, built probably around her Ramesses 30th regnal year, served as workshops, administrative departments, houses and storerooms with honey, oils, wine, corn or incense. As the rituals and offerings took place every day, bakeries, butcher and tailor shops were located in the premises. Twelve storerooms, larger than others, with an impressive portico displaying 28 columns, were identified as a treasure house. Inside the temple, in its hypostyle hall, Ramesses left an inscription. Build up supplies in the food stores until they reach the sky. Let the treasure store be filled with electrum, gold, royal linen and all sorts of precious stones. 
To the south of the first courtyard was a mud brick palace, which served rather as a preparation room for rituals, especially during the pharaoh's visitations, than an official residence of the king. It featured a window of royal appearance facing the courtyard, where, according to testimonies found in the tombs of the priests, Ramesses sometimes showed himself. Nevertheless, the most important purpose of this palace was naturally a symbolic one. In the throne chamber, a false door stele was placed to enable the deceased pharaoh to take part in festivals and sacred practices. The Ramesseum has more secrets. It was used as a burial place in the Third Intermediate Period and in the Late Period. One of the most recent discoveries was a shaft grave belonging to a queen of the 22nd dynasty, Karomama. The excavations are still ongoing, but I have managed to go down one of these closed tombs. There was however one condition. No camera. Hope to have more luck in the future as we will definitely come back to Ramassium. We can now take a sneak peek into another recent discovery, the processional path, which apart from typical sphinxes with human heads, featured one of a kind, jackals on chapel-shaped pedestals. The imposing ruins of Ramassium remain one of the symbols of Western Thebes and a tourist attraction of Luxor. Its uniqueness is best described by the father of Egyptology, the aforementioned Champollion. The Ramassium is the most dilapidated monument in Thebes, but it is also, without any doubt, that which, by the elegant majesty of its ruins, leaves in the minds of visitors the most profound and lasting impression. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. To stay tuned, please tap the subscribe button and help my channel grow by liking, commenting and sharing my content with your friends. See you on another ancient site!